Hello, everyone, and welcome to the AWS Nordic's Ask Me Anything Office Hours. I am Gunnar Grosch, and I am a developer advocate here at AWS. And I'm going to take you through this hour of AWS knowledge sharing. So as usual, we have one specific topic to talk about. But this show is, as always, very much about you, so our viewers. If you have any questions, just post them in the chat, and we'll do our best to answer, be it on the topic or whatever question you have around AWS. We'll give it a shot to give you a great answer. And this week, I am joined by specialist solutions architect for serverless, Nicholas Muchen. Welcome to the show, Nicholas. Yeah, hey, good night. Thank you so much for, for having me here. It's um, always a pleasure to, to connect with everyone. So, you know, as Gunnar said, if you have questions, I mean, if it's serverless related, I can probably answer. Uh, if it's another topic, I'll defer to, to, to Gunnar. Um, but just to quickly present myself. Um, so, as Gunnar said, I'm a serverless um, specialist solution architect. So, first of all, what's a solution architect? Uh, our role is to help um, AWS customers in terms of designing and architecting workloads you know, on AWS. And in my case, being a specialist, I really focus on all things serverless. Uh, so, you know, Lambda, API Gateway, Avon Bridge, SNS, SQS, you know, what, everything that doesn't have servers where you pay on demand and scales for you under the hood, right? It's kind of where, where I um, am quite involved. All right. Well, uh, once again, thanks for being here, Nicholas. So the topic for today is serverless ops. And we're going to dive into that just in a few moments. But first off, I want to show you our upcoming schedule. Uh, this is a show that's on every Monday, 1 p.m. CET. And uh, we are next week going to talk about containers with Andreas Lind. Then we have a couple of shows about AI ML, machine learning. And before we have our secret episode that I've been hinting about for a couple of weeks now, uh, still to be announced. Uh, and then we have an episode with Tim about databases. And besides that, I also want to uh, show you this, if you don't know about it. At our page for this show, we have a way for you to interact with us on a one-to-one -one basis. So you can schedule a one-to-one -one meeting with AWS experts. So if you go to the, to the AWS Nordisk Ask Me Anything splash, splash page, you're able to just click the button and schedule schedule a meeting to ask about anything that you have, particular um, things you want to build using AWS, if you have questions around certain services and so on. So schedule a one-to-one -one meeting with AWS experts. All right, that was it for the boilerplate part of this session. Now, Nicholas, let's get back to the topic of the day, serverless ops. And I think this is uh, something that people are perhaps a bit hesitant as to what it is, because uh, we sometimes hear that there isn't that much operation when it comes to serverless. So what do you define as serverless ops? Yeah, it's, it's I mean, to, to your point, I think it's a really interesting uh, topic. That's kind of why I wanted to kind of talk more about that. We, we often think of ops as, OK, let's go maintain the servers. Let's go update, you know. Um, and it's things that usually you do much less in, in the serverless world, right? I mean, you don't have servers to manage anymore. So indeed, there's way less ops. Um, I mean, it doesn't mean that there is no ops in serverless. There's still some bits because at the end of the day, what is ops? Ops is making sure that your workload is going to run, is going to work properly um, when you run it. And, you know, we write code, code has bugs, you know, uh, and then... As our, our CTO, you know, Werner Vogel says all the time, I mean, things break all the time, right? Um, so even within that, it's important to still consider, hey, what can break? How can it break? And how can I know, you know, observe and, and try to find what's breaking? I mean, that's only one part. And then you also have making sure we can release changes in a way that's safe is not going to break production, right? So this the whole thing around that that's still present in serverless. So a lot of the things that we we have as practices for any type of workload, no matter if it's serverless or not, are workload. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there are less of some things, right? Of course, I don't have to patch my Linux operating system. I, you know, I don't have to think, do I have enough EC2 instances? Um, but you still have things like, oh, 
you know, I'm using a library in my code that now has a vulnerability. I need to patch that. I need to update that, right? Or maybe there was a bug in my code and now I, you know, people can't use my application anymore. You know, how can I make sure that everything is fine, that I can, you know, keep keep on top of all these things, basically? So the notion of no ops, that's something we can just uh, take away now. It, it's not a thing. Yeah, it, it's there's always going to be some part of ops, right? It's it's as soon as something is in production, you could have something that breaks, you can have something that goes wrong or something you didn't plan. So no ops sounds very interesting. I mean, serverless is you know way less ops. Uh, mm. As someone that's before you know working for AWS, I went through a whole journey of having servers in the data center, then moving to EC2, you know, and so on, so on, all the way to, to serverless um, before, I, you know, before I joined AWS. Like, the amount of operations was just reducing at each step, right? But there's still some you know, at the end of the day. Right. So uh, let's start off with, with one of the things that we define as, as operations for serverless then. Um, where do you want to start, Nicholas? I think you know, one thing that's really important to, to think about early on is the observability part, right? It's understanding what's the status of my application. You know, is it working well? You know, the worst part is uh, getting notified that your application is not working by your customers, right? Uh, you really want to, to prevent that. You really want to know as fast as possible when something goes wrong. And the key part in that is observability. Uh, and that's, I mean, as the name implies, it's observing, having something that's observable. You can see what's happening. You can see if there's any errors, everything going fine, if, you know, latency is not too high and so on. Yeah, so observ observability is, um, how do we define that then? Is it the same as monitoring only, or do we, do we see that as a bigger thing? Because monitoring is perhaps the traditional way to just watch metrics and see that things work as they should. But observability, yeah. is a, it's a bigger uh, field, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I should have prepped definitions. Because uh, <laughs> I There's don't have... There's going to be a lot of questions around the definitions. Yeah, for yeah, sure, yeah. So. yeah, but I mean, indeed, it's making something up. I mean, the idea is to make it observable, right? Being able to understand its behavior and seeing if the behavior of your application match what you were expecting. Right, so it's not just looking at metrics and if my metrics look good, right? There's a few more things behind that. Um, and I mean, it's still a fairly flexible and, and fluid thing, uh, I think, but basically the core, the core is, can I see that it's behaving the way I expect it? You know? mm -hmm. uh, and, and we'll walk through a sample application that I wrote um, around you know, ordering you know, uh, as part of an e-commerce platform. Can users make order? Can I fulfill these orders? Does, is everything working fine on that? Right. It's it's kind of the key part uh, at the end of the yep. day. So, do you want to jump into that example straight away to to show a bit about observability for an actual application? Yeah, sure. I mean, at, at least it will put a bit of context in the the scene, you know, yeah. um, while people are joining and and starting to drop questions. So, this is a. Uh, sample architecture that I built last year. Um, it's, there were a few key ideas behind that. The, the idea was to show you know, a bit more complex and bit um, larger applications that we typically build as samples. So here you have 10 different microservices that interact together. And another key part I wanted to do is to build it event-driven. I, I hear a lot, I talk a lot about event-driven architectures. Lots of people are interested into that. Um, I wanted to make something a bit more concrete. So the key thing here, um, it's an e-commerce platform, so it's made to, to have orders coming in and so on. And so you have these different microservices going into order creation, then you know in the warehouse, someone needs to package it and we need to ship it and so on. And of course, during the whole process, things can go wrong, you know, so we need to also track that and you have recoveries and so on. And when the application is event driven, it basically means that we're building the application around different events that happen in that application. So an event might be that an order is created. Or yeah, um, yeah I, I like to to think about that. You know, comparing commands and even, uh, events, right? So here, you know, uh, at this point, you have an order is being created, right? That's the events. Uh, as in anyone who wants to listen, that uh, there's a new order. You know, here we have the warehouse, but maybe we want also to have some analytics, some BI and so on, tracking you know, these kind of things. 
But if you think about the command, that would be, hey, you warehouse service, go package this order for me, please. Right. So that's kind of the difference here. It's just a very targeted thing. While here, it's Evan said being sent uh, left and right. Yeah. So one to many compared to one to one. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. All right. So walk us through the the application then, and, and yeah, why so, observability then is 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 a must have in these mm -hmm. types of applications. So I mean, here you know, if I if I think about the the customer experience, right? You want to log in, log out. You want to be able to search products. I mean, the key part I really focus on was the whole delivery and ordering cycle, but. Ultimately, you, you know, create your cart and so on, and then you want to create an order from that, right? You want to start, you want to actually order the things. Um, so, first thing we need to do is just a synchronous call to different microservices, and that's a critical part of the architecture uh, to make sure that all the information are correct, right? Validating the products that we can deliver to to that area and the delivery price is correct, and that you also have a valid payment token so we can you know handle the transaction. When all that is validated, the order is created, so we emit the event. And then the next step in the in the chain will be to take the items from that order, you know, package them, right? And then we have a package that is then ready to be shipped. And then we can then ship it and deliver it, right? I mean, but in the process, you might have a few things that go wrong, as in, um, well, none of the items are available, or we couldn't deliver because, for example, the address doesn't exist. Well, that's the case. We have you know events on failures, so packaging failed, delivery failed, that will trigger reimbursement um, and so on. Or we can also have a situation where, um, let's say, you order ten items, but only nine are available. Well, we can still ship the nine. We we'll just reimburse you for the tenth one instead. Uh, of course, you know that's not a use case that fits every commerce platform, right? The, it's it's a fairly simplified scenario. Uh, and then, of course, once the delivery is done, you know, then we process the payment, we mark the order as complete, and that's uh, the end of the story there. So that's kind of the flow overall. And on the observability part, I mean, a few things that are important is making sure that all these you know, are working correctly. That when you have an order, I mean, that we can create order, that we can track and so on, you know, that the... Um, Warehouse, you know, we are packaging it correctly, you know, and, and all the chain is working because if we start to have errors somewhere in the process, you know, or or even things like, oh, we are missing lots of items suddenly, right? These are all kind of things that are important to, to be aware of. Um, so I can showcase a bit because, you know, first thing first is showcasing a bit the kind of what can we see from that application. So I have a few dashboards uh, yeah. and my strategy was one per microservice. So I have one here that I think is um, pretty nice. It's uh, so CloudWatch uh, dashboard. And so I have um, different things. So this is for the order service. So the entry gate where all the orders are coming in. And I can see how many orders were created, um, how many were fulfilled. Uh, and also if I have any failure on the orders here. So these are kind of my key business metrics. And same thing here, I had one error um, happening. I've been sending some traffic for a few hours now to generate, you know, before before this. I had one error that, that happened, which, you know, for 200 uh, plus thousand orders is, you know, sometimes errors happen, you know, things fail all the time. Uh, so yeah. that's a pretty reasonable number. But then I have also two other metrics that are important to track. You know, really from, from a customer experience perspective, because these, uh, the create order, right? If you are a, you know, you want to create an order and then you have to wait 10 seconds and so on, right? That's a bad experience. So it's important to track here, making sure everything is okay. Um, so I track um, the, the value, so at different percentile. So if you're not aware of what percentiles are, uh, P50 means you know, that's 50% of the users are getting this, you know, uh, all wars, right? P90 is, um, uh, it's actually the opposite, right? It's getting this or better. P90 mm. is this or, you know, 90% 90 are getting this or better, right? So that means that 10% of users are getting a longer latency than this. And I also have P99, which is the same, you know, with 1% are getting lo longer than this. And so I can track because... If, as I said, if you start waiting five seconds, and when I created this, uh, it was actually taking three seconds 
So I had to do some optimization to bring it down to, to 500 ms uh, on this level, just to kind of improve the experience. Same thing on this side, you know, it's another thing, but this one is much faster. The problem why this one is taking so long is because we need to wait for the systems behind. And looking at these types of metrics, I think uh, it's pretty important to think about why you want to have these metrics. Why is it important to know what the latency is for creating an order, for instance? Because yeah. not only for the operation of the application, but also for the business. Looking yeah, at, I mean, and in this case, a business trying to sell things, if you have a higher latency for orders, you are going to get customers dropping off the platform. So yeah. defining what is an important metric for you, that's that's also part of um, defining what what to observe in your application. Yeah, and, and I think it's it really goes back to, you know, what's the business outcome from that? You know, it's because there are actually other Lambda functions in this application, but they tend to be asynchronous. So latency doesn't doesn't matter as much, right, compared to these ones which are user facing. Because mm. um, I have also all the other metrics. Um, so that's for the ones that are, you know, uh, impacting. I can really track and go into the detail. Um, but then if I look at the asynchronous one, well, it's less important. Um, I, I'm, I'm fine with having higher latency there. That will help steer a bit what you should be looking at in your application. Um, of course, errors in general are always a good thing to, to look at, right? Um, but this helps a lot kind of figuring out where are the bottlenecks, what's important for my end users, uh, and so on. Time for another definition than synchronous versus asynchronous. I think uh, if people are unaware about the difference. So, Niklas. Yeah. So actually for this, I'll propose we zoom a bit deeper. Uh, so in the repository here, for each uh, microservice, there's one folder. And so here, if we go just to drill onto orders, um, I can show you the diagram just for that service. So yeah, it's actually. Open image, oh, yeah, copy image location, that will do. We can share the link to this repo as well later on so people ah, can yeah. have a look themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we'll do. Uh, but just to go a bit into just this service here. Um, so we have, you know, um, synchronous means, uh, in, the, like, in the context of, of uh, Lambda functions specifically, synchronous means you know, a function is getting a request and will send a response back. So here, you know, we have, for example, the delivery service need to fetch some data from our other service. So they contact an internal API gateway and they want the response immediately. Or, you know, when we create order, I mean, we need to confirm to the end user, like, yeah, your order went through, you know, everything went fine. So these are synchronous. But now, you know, we have, uh, because our order service keep the tra track of the state of an order. So whenever there is a change, whenever there is a problem, or whenever the order is completed, it will keep track of all these. It will listen to all these events. Um, and then it will asynchronously invoke a function. It's asynchronous here because this function doesn't need to send a result back. You know, it's just going to take that event and then process it uh, further. And that's actually a key part in an event-driven architecture is that we are moving from only you know request response to this kind of asynchronous invocation, right? Here we have an update asynchronously. It's going to send um, this update on the bus. All the things will be triggered asynchronously. Um, and that allows us to, I mean, have this kind of event-driven uh, system there. Yeah, and then as you said, that also uh, means that we can think differently about what to observe in the applications because some things are really important. Latency in a synchronous mm -hmm. call where the user is actually waiting for a response is of course more important than in an asynchronous yeah. call. Yeah, yeah. I mean, on this one, like waiting for events, all that matters is that the event is processed, right? I mean, yeah. if it's taking two hours, that's a different question. Um, but what matters is that the event is processed. Um, but yeah, here, you know, we want to have a good experience. Like here we have something waiting. We have the delivery service waiting. Or here it's it's even more important. We have a customer waiting, right? And if our customers start waiting too long, they'll refresh the page, they'll move, you know, and and, uh, and so on and so on. So it's quite important to to keep track of that there. 
Right. So if you just joined us, I am joined here by Nicholas Mutchen today. We're talking about serverless ops at the AWS Nordics office hours. Uh, but this is an ask me anything session. So if you have questions around serverless ops, serverless, or any type of AWS question, just post them in the chat and we'll do our best to try to answer them. Right now, we're talking about observability for serverless applications as part of the serverless ops topic. Yeah. Yeah, and, and so actually, I want, I want to show um, one thing for the viewers. It's kind of a really nice li library we've been working on. Um, if you're looking for something that simplifies observability for your application, um, so let me just show some code now. Uh, it's actually, I'll. And I think everyone is looking for things uh, that makes it easier to for observability of applications Be because it is a hard topic. It, it's not easy to to know exactly how and what to observe in an application. So, yeah. so the answer is yes. We are looking for something to make it easier. Yeah. So um, uh, there is this library. It's called uh, Lambda Power Tools. Right now, it's available for uh, both Python and Java. More languages are coming soon. And in this library, you have a few core utilities uh, around so logging custom metrics so for example you know the order created number you know that's something that came as a custom metric um, but also logging all the all the things and using structured logging um, which I'll go a bit into why it's important and then also tracing we'll we actually uh, also need to take a look uh, at that part so tracing will do correlation between you know, different components of an application when you have a flow going on so that you can see end-to-end -end what's happening. And so with this uh, library, we can easily add, so if you are used to Python, so if you're not used to Python, actually, def is the way to define a function. Uh, handler here is the one for my Lambda handler. And by doing this, add something, it's a decorator. So it will um, wrap my handler to inject so a context for the logger, it will uh, capture uh, for my tracing and also you know, something to, to keep track of the, um, of the metrics. And then I have a few basic, basic checks here to make sure you know, my request is valid. But then um, I have the, the validation uh, going on, you know, validating the order here to make sure everything is good and then restoring it. And then once that's done, you know, I'm storing uh, the logs just so I can keep track um, in, in my logs. I can correlate later and so on. I can, and one thing I do, um, I mentioned a bit structured logging. So structured logging is the idea of, instead of just putting just a text, like a string saying, yeah, order X was created. I will also put metadata information. So I have my message, order X, but also put the order ID here. And that will allow me to search this log later. If, there ha if I had an issue with that order, I can always go and search in the logs uh, using the order ID. And here, uh, on I, in a debug message, I'll see put the full order. So when I look at my logs, I can see, yeah, there was this product and so on. I can see all the details. And then finally, that's the uh, thing I'm doing, you know, for the, uh, every time I create an order, I have a custom metric just for the order created. So for my business level metrics. I see that the chat is getting pretty active here. It is. Uh, so should we try to, to just get a question in there while we are on this topic. So sure. we have a question around CloudWatch alarms, um, uh, perhaps tied together with the dashboard we looked at earlier. So um, Surshit has a CloudWatch alarm to trigger an email notification when there is a Lambda failure. And he has questions around that. Mm -hmm. First off, is there a better way to do this? Um, I guess the question is, is there a better way to get that notification than to have an email uh, notification? Yeah, yeah, it actually, so let's start with just this one because there's already a lot to think about um, because email is, I mean, it's nice when there is really something wrong going on. I mean, there's a few ways, right? You have things like pages that ping you, call you and so on. When there's really something going wrong. Um, but that actually brings a bit the question about are all alarms, you know, the same thing? Are all alarms really worrisome? Um, because sometimes you might have different tiers of alarms. You might have something as in, hey, that's a warning. And if I have multiple alarms going up at the same time, I might actually need to do something there. 
but one on itself might just be an email that I can read on Monday. Or then they can, they are, there is something that can actually be automatically remediated. As in, um, let's say you do a deployment, and as part of that, um, you can have alarms that check you know, if everything went well. And then if something went wrong, we can do a rollback automatically. Uh, so that's one thing that's possible to do. Sometimes you can do automated action uh, just to make sure everything is fine. It's kind of the, the thing with emails that is the last resort when you actually need a human you know, to look at the problem. Um, but then on the email, you actually have all things you can centralize with SNS. Um, so an SNS topic sending to different systems. Um, just so this way you can have different uh, mechanism or different e sending to different people and so on. Or of course, if it's emailed to one person, what if that person is sick? You know, you might need this escalation chain and so on. Yeah, uh, I think that's a good point. I spent a weekend where there was no cell uh, coverage this weekend. So mm -hmm. no emails, email alerts for me this weekend. And the second part of the question is, that the notification that he does receive only has info that there was a failure and link to the dashboard. So is there a way to expand on the email to get more info on it? Uh, I think if you think about the direct integration, not necessarily, but that's kind of where you can build a more complete you know, uh, system that will not only just give you the, the link to the dashboard, but tell you, hey, this is exactly what, what happened. So you can do something that will trigger SNS. SNS will trigger Lambda function that will aggregate all this information for you. So give me the latest data, data point. Let's generate a nice uh, graph for you to look at um, so that you can send all the information that are relevant in the email. You know, So people will waste less time. And you can see quickly, like, OK, you know, okay, we just have an intermittent issue here, but it's already recovering. Or on the opposite side, like, oh no, this is, you know, I really need to act on that. And just seeing uh, the errors in the graphs, I have a good idea of where that could be. So you can use CloudWatch Logs Insight, um, you know, with, with the structured logging here to kind of search for errors and so on. Right. So, so to summarize um, this entire thing then about email notifications for alarms is that um, there are better ways of doing it, and, and perhaps getting one email message per alarm, it, it, it's it's not best practice. It, it might mean that you get spammed with emails. Some are important, some are not, and it's hard to to differentiate between them as well. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you get two hundred emails, will you read them? And there might be one alarm that's important. Will you read them? Right. So it's it's really yeah. important to get quality data when when there is an alert, when there is a problem. Yeah. Um, and having that, the, um, talking about alarms and talking about metrics, dashboards, and so on, what data you're showing, what data you're you're able to or supposed to act upon, that, that's really important in, in defining yeah. what you want to monitor and what you want to observe as well. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, we have another question. Let's do that as well. So by Kunal. Uh, how do we do distributed tracing in this example, uh, the example you're just showing? Is there an easy way to see the telemetry, mm. how the request traveled from one service to the other, uh, rather than going to CloudWatch logs every time? And you mentioned tracing. Yeah. Thank you. That, that's a perfect intro for, for that topic. Um, <laughs> because there is something. So I'm using X-Ray um, under the hood, right? And so X-Ray is a service to do just that, uh, to do this kind of distributed tracing. So if I look a bit, uh, we'll filter, let's let's filter by our create order uh, function. I think it's this one. Yeah, there we go. So we can see here, we click, just because I want to show one node, you know, since this is the complete application and so on, the graph is fairly large. Uh, but here I can drill down um, just to show you one trace. And actually, just looking at the trace you know, for a specific node, I can already get some information as in percentages of error throttles fault. Or, you know, here we have 100% OK, that's great. Um, but also have the curve of latency overall, so I can track um, what's my end-to-end uh, -end latency here. But then if we just go through, let's say, this one, taken randomly, I'll just zoom out a bit so we can see uh, the entire graph. Then here we can see what's happening. Uh, we can see an, we have an end-to-end -end view uh, where the client is um, 
It's so actually there is an app sync uh, here that goes to my Lambda function for creating order. As I mentioned at the beginning, this one then needs to go through three different microservices, and that's kind of what we see. Um, what we see here. So this one is the product one, uh, payment, and then here we have delivery pricing just to validate. And these can do different things uh, based on what they need. So this one actually continues further. And then once the order is validated, we write it into the DynamoDB table. So first thing we have here is this kind of end-to-end -end view. Um, and I can see on each node, you know, um, more information. But when we go want to really drill down into the details, I can scroll here in my say, and I can see. So the trace is going to be the entire flow end to end, but within that trace, I'll have segments, right? So I'll have a segment for my for my APIs, for my Lambda functions, and so on. And I can start drilling into all these segments, and that's where the instrumentation that I showed. So with the Lambda Power Tools, I can decorate each of my function in my code. So here I have the handler, you know, cleanup, validate function. Uh, and here I have validated delivery payment, and then I can see exactly what's happening. It also wraps the um, AWS SDKs and standard libraries, so I can see how long did it take to contact that you know, uh, API here. And then I can, because everything is traced end to end, and I have you know uh, this kind of this kind of level of granularity throughout. I can continue scroll and see everywhere how long did everything take, you know what happened at each step. Um, and so on. So I can have a very pretty good view here of everything that happened end to end. So how would you say one is, how do you work with distributed tracing? Is it you have an error and you then use the distributed tracing to drill down to find what is causing the error? Or for instance, you have high latency in certain calls and you then use that to drill down to see what is causing that latency. Yeah, exactly. And and the thing that's really nice here, I mean, there's a few different ways to do that, right? But because I can uh, filter here on errors and so on, right? if I had errors, I could actually filter to only show the trace with errors. And then I can start looking into the finer details. It's kind of, you know, the debugging process is first get an alert. So know what's, what to monitor on to get the right alerts. But then through that, you start to inspect and try to narrow down what is the probable cause. And maybe you've identified it was one Lambda function, right? I mean, the thing is, if you have only one person of, you know, a cause of causing an error and you want to log through, you know, look at all the, um, uh, all the um, calls and all the logs, you know, you will have 99% of things that went well. You just want the one person that failed. Mm. And so there are two ways to do that. So one way is um, here. Another way that I didn't show in my dashboard I actually have this section on last 20 errors. I didn't have any errors to show. Um, but the way it works is it's using CloudWatch logs inside. And so here I can do a query. And because I'm using structured logs, I can do a query uh, such as, here yeah, I have a typo. Um, but I can filter on level equals error. And then I can see like what was the order ID, what was the actual message inside, and so on. Um, but so I can drill down this way and filter only on the things that are important for me. Right. Uh, and who who uses this? And is it, uh, uh, of course, depending on the organization, but uh, the developers, while they want to, to improve on the application, or uh, it might be a specific ops team or a live ops team, something that's some team that is working on, on uh, observing the application on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, I think it, it kind of depends a bit, right? Because if you try to troubleshoot a bug that you're having, it ends up being the developers using that, right? So as a developer, it's really important to, to put that. Um, but then if you think about the observable, I mean, it, the, the entire space, it depends a bit on how you're structured, how you work as a company. Uh, so I, I'm a big advocate for what we call a, um, at AWS two pizza team, where as developers, you own you know the entire stack of the application. That means you also own the operational part. Um, but sometimes, you know, sometimes it's another team that does the on night, you know, on call at night or something like this, right? So they also will look and have queries and so on. Um, and one thing that's nice, by the way, with CloudWatch logs inside is that once you write a query that you like, you can actually save it 
or I mean, you can also copy and paste it into some wiki internally and so on, so that it's easy for people to to use this kind of useful queries uh, to go through um, through the logs. We had a question around that also. Uh, can the error log query be exported in any way directly from the dashboard? Uh, I suppose the the output of the query. Um, uh, that's a good question because usually when I see that, I just go deeper into into the um, the thing and I go and then into CloudWatch logs inside, right? So we got a, a follow up message oh. uh, from the same user. Uh, the export results button is directly below. So there we go. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> great. Uh, oh yeah, here we can export the results here to CSV go. and so on. Yeah, yeah, that's good. All right. So uh, that was a bit about distributed tracing. Um, but we were still on how to make it easier to, to start observing your application. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so let me actually just go back. Uh, I was mentioning this, this Lambda portals. And it was really the, 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 the key point. Uh, I saw that uh, Ato Lesa is in the chat. Um, by the way, he's the one that came up with the idea of the Lambda portals. So credits to him there. But the idea is, okay, you know, best practice. Uh, the we have this thing called the well-acted framework that says, hey, you should do observability. You should do, you know, you, you should have these um, metrics and tracing and so on. But you know, the question is then, how do I get started? What do I, what do I do? There's two problems, right? The problem is, how can we make it easy for developers to just have this? Uh, you know, all this thing that's you know, basically with three lines of code, I can start uh, counting number of orders, but also the total value. That's also something very relevant for the business because if the average value of order is dropping or the total amount of order is dropping, you know, uh, if, if I lose 50% of orders, you know, uh, immediately, maybe something is wrong that I'm not catching, right? So it's also something that I want to, to observe. And then I showed a bit in the tracing. And basically for each function, so that's you know different function here, I have this tracer capture method. And that makes it really easy for me to instrument at the function level. And one thing is if I have an error, for example, in this function, if something goes wrong here, I will see that it was this function specifically in my traces. So it helps me narrow down very quickly uh, where it is. And so just to show you a bit, um, is it uh, there we go so here we have the lambda power tools for, for python and so i mentioned the three things you know tracing logging metrics um then there's not just your lambda function right you should also enable it on for example api gateway and so on uh, where you can you should enable tracing but we also bring other uh, utilities within the power tools to make it easy uh, to do a few other things you know like how to cache and retrieve parameters and a few other things um, into that. Right. Um, so can, can you switch back to the example you showed how uh, one would use power tools? Yeah. So comparing that to how you would do it without power tools then just to get an image of, of how it actually helps you. Yeah, it's it's um, it's actually on, on tracing. You would use the X-ray SDK, um, which is depending on your programming language, pretty straightforward. Uh, the benefit here is kind of the it injects also all the things. So uh, if I go into the structured logging uh, part, for example, it injects information about the lambda function, whether it's a call start, a few other things here that might be relevant for you to to keep track of. So. Um, it's possible to do, uh, and in most cases, it's wrapped around you know um, recommended practices. So, um, for example, custom metrics. Uh, one thing I see a common mistake I see there when people are getting started with custom metrics is just using the address SDK and making calls to CloudWatch directly. But actually, a trick you can do, and that the portals does, which is writing a log in a specific structure, and that automatically gets published as metric. And this actually save on cost because you don't do you know uh, you don't do put metric cost uh, calls to to CloudWatch uh, metrics anymore, and so you actually save on cost doing that. So the benefit of having a tool like this is that we can embed some of these you know recommend practices so that you don't have to figure it out for them for yourself. Yeah, and I want to go back to to 
observability and metrics and dashboards mm. and so on because knowing what to observe we we touched a bit about that you you need to find what is important for you um, to to look at but also i think it's really important to know what the steady state of your application is and um, that's something that we often talk about in regards to reliability knowing how your application behaves on a day-to-day -day basis and and having this data available, it means that it's easier for you to know the steady state. What is the normal time for orders uh, or the latency for creating orders, for instance, and having that data available in an easy way, because then you're able to see when something isn't working as intended, when something is wrong, even though you perhaps doesn't have, you, you don't have to have alarms on, on anything, everything, but you can still be able to, to know when things are starting to go wrong. So you're yeah. able to act before perhaps. Yes, actually, let me, yeah, there we go. So, and actually there's a really nice feature for that if you want to, to simplify it. Of course, I just started the application today, right? Started sending load today. Um, but there is a really nice feature within CloudWatch Alarms, which is this anomaly detection, because, you know, the steady state might not be as steady, you know, over a day, or over a week, you know. Um, people might, if you think about e-commerce, you know, People won't shop that much at night uh, or, you know, when they are working, maybe, I mean, well, maybe they'll take a break, but you would expect the orders to maybe come early in the morning when people are waking up before they start working or in the evening and maybe more, you know, in the weekend. So the steady state might actually be fluctuating and having something, you know, that's do anomaly detection and actually look um, on, on what's normal uh, for your use case might be actually interesting for that. I mean, it's also important for you to kind of have a sense uh, there, right? Because if you see, ah, oh, yeah, usually we're getting, you know, we're getting two thousand orders an hour, and now we had five hundred. You know, that's that's a bit low. Getting this kind of knowledge and so on uh, is also very important. Yeah, as you said, the the steady state isn't always steady over time. It might yeah. change depending on the day of the week, hour of the day, day of the year, and so on. Of course. Um, and anom anomaly detection. Uh, we have more and more services starting to use that type of, of features. Uh, and often, uh, or perhaps always, they are powered by machine learning. So it learns based on your data to then detect these anomalies. And, and that's something that you can use straight uh, out of the box with certain CloudWatch features, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it's actually there's this new one uh, that, that that was announced at reInvent. I haven't time to the time I haven't had the chance to play with it yet. But indeed, I mean anything that can actively learn for your tra normal traffic pattern. Because one thing we we you know I mentioned what if the the odd number of orders dropping by fifty percent. But what if my odd number of orders increasing by four hundred percent suddenly? Right? Is it maybe I need to keep a look on that as well because it mm. might be anomalous traffic. It might be some bots, you know, um, you know let's say you do, um, you sell a product that's very limited in quantity. You know, uh, bots is, you know, that's very popular. Bots are a risk. You know, you don't want people to just buy it so that they can resell it at three times the price. You want to limit that. So being able to see what's normal and then telling you like, hey, we are outside of the normal in, you know, maybe a good way. Maybe you just became very, you know, you have a very successful marketing campaign. But being able to see that and tell you like, hey, something, uh, you need to just take a look at this is really important. Yeah. We had a question around uh, using the power tools, any cold start or latency impact. I see Aether uh, answered it in the chat, but let's do it yeah. on air as well. So. Are there any cold start or latency impacts because of power tools? Yeah, it, it is. And it mostly comes from the initialization of the X-ray uh, SDK. So because we use, I mean, the, the Lambda power tools use the AWS SDKs under the hood, right? Um, and so as Ato pointed out in the comment, it takes around 400 uh, milliseconds on top of that. I actually wrote, um, and I think I can show it to you, um, I wrote here, there is this folder called benchmark, uh, um, which adds a way to compare cold start and warm start for when you're using the power tools versus without. So you can actually quantify what's the uh, effective impact uh, for that. So there is a cold start impact 
because we need to initialize X-ray and so on. I mean, you wouldn't have the same if you were just using X-ray by itself. Mm. Yeah, so it's not really the power tools in itself. It's it's using X-ray that's causing that uh, yeah. added latency. Um, so we've now looked at native AWS services for doing this, but there are, of course, other services, third-party services that can help with observability and so on as well. And perhaps mm -hmm. using it in a combination with AWS services, with CloudWatch, X-Ray, and so on, and different third-party services. So that's a matter of choice, what, what you want, uh, how you want to work with it. And perhaps, depending on what your organization is used, using yeah. anyway or since before yeah and uh, actually there's a feature that really helps on that because it, it's something we got um a lot you know you might be using a, a tool i mean if you you only have serverless applications you can you know uh, or even then you know application that integrates really well with aws it's easy to just use the aws toolbox but what if you have still things on premises what if you have things you know elsewhere that's not on aws that you also want to to observe in one central way um so for Lambda, we released uh, a few things, notably Lambda extensions. So you can have an extension um, from you know, certain vendors for observability and so on that can then track, you know, report on, on things there um, to, to complement to that, you, to make sure that you have this kind of one way of doing things that you don't spread you know, with, with 20 different... Because once again, if you have 20 different tools and you need to go between these 20 different tools, that becomes a bit complicated as well. Mm. That's right. Let's put this in there. We have a question uh, around upcoming support for node lambdas. Yeah. So it's part of the languages that we are working on. Uh, I think it's pretty high on the on the on the list of things we we're doing right now, uh, because I mean, lots of people are using you know Node and, and JavaScript and TypeScript. So it's something we're actively working on. So. Um, Keep keep an eye on that. <laughs> yeah. So I yeah. mean, if you follow me on social media, you know, you you'll get uh, you'll get the announcements. So you you, you see it's uh, it's yeah like uh, <laughs> there we go now. Uh, so if you follow one. me on Twitter, um, then you'll get you know you'll see when we announce it. Yeah, you can follow me as well. I'll probably retweet when Nicholas tweets it. Otherwise, so <laughs> there we go. All right. Uh, so this is the AWS Nordics Office Hours Ask Me Anything edition. Uh, I am joined by Nicholas Mochen, specialist solutions architect for serverless at AWS. And today we're talking about serverless ops. So the operation of the serverless workloads applications. And we talked about uh, observability. We talked about um, with that then metrics, tracing, and so on. And we talked about how power tools can help with with uh, getting started using observability in perhaps an easier way. Uh, but I think we have one more thing we want to talk about, which is the well-architected framework yeah. and the serverless part of that. We still have 12 minutes, I think, Nicholas. Mm -hmm. Can we cover the, the serverless framework in 12 minutes? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, there's a few different ways to, to use it, right? Uh, so this is um, in the, if you search, you know, on, on your search engine of choice. Um, for well-architected frameworks, serverless lens, we actually have... So the well-architected framework in general is a set of recommended practices based on you know, the experience, talking to customers and so on, seeing how customers are actually architecting and running uh, workloads on AWS. And it's based on five pillars that you can see here. So operations, security, reliability, performance, and cost optimization. But in the general one, there's, there's these kind of questions uh, which are very helpful, but then might not be always targeted for serverless workloads, right? Because there are some things as in, hey, how do you manage capacity planning? Well, it's a bit less of a question in serverless applications, right? I don't have EC2 instances anymore. I don't need to size them. Um, but there are still some things that, that are important. So, for example, I touched a bit around uh, structured logging, something that I like to, to talk about. And so in this... It's available both in HTML and PDF. Uh, if I, if you go here into best practices, you have a lot of different things to, to look at. So here I was talking about centralized and structured logging. Centralized being, we mentioned in your CloudWatch logs or using another tool, but it's important to have a central place to look at them. 
And then having this kind of information that you add here, such as was it a cold start or other metadata so that you can search and filter um, based on the um, actual data in your request, no, not just on um, um, not just on a string of text, for example. And then you have lots of best practices here. But then there's another thing um, in the AWS console that can actually help you a lot when you go, you know, when you make some um, uh, an application. One thing you can do, and I actually recommend you to review that, you know, fairly frequently, is use what's called the well architected tool. And then you can go through all the questions, answer them yourself. Um, so if I take here, uh, let's do yeah, let's do like this just to showcase. You will get, then get the questions um, and then a series of answers. So it's uh, you know you check the boxes that fit you, um, and you also get some recommendations here. So with videos, with some links and so on. Every time, so if I click info here, it will give me like a bit more information. Um, on on how you know how you can do uh, potentially improve on this, and once again goes into the different pillars here. Yeah, so so that's the well architected framework from a serverless lens. That's where the yeah. name ca came <laughs> from, perhaps. Uh, but this is. is um, it doesn't really make changes to your application or it doesn't improve the application itself through this tool. This is a way for you to make sure that you're doing things according to what we consider best practices through yeah. um, or with the well-architected framework. And, and actually, one thing you can do is you do milestones and you, then you can come back, let's say, three months later. Hey, did we progress on that? Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I, I really like to well acted the tool for is helping prioritize this kind of you know operational aspects of your workload. It's easy to just think, okay, let's ship new features, let's ship new features, but we might miss track of hey, it's actually there is this security risk. I mean, it's not that big of a risk, but it's something we should definitely do this year. Um, and then you save a milestone, then you know a few months later you come back to it like, did you actually do something about it, or were we too busy with something else? Oh, maybe we should. You know, review your priorities, right? Uh, it, it leads to very interesting discussions. I mean, I've seen, uh, I've had the chance to participate in some of these reviews with customers, and it's really interesting to see the discussion popping up. Uh, sometimes clarification between teams, as in, uh, you know, the developers were thinking one thing, you had product owners thinking something else, mm. you have, you know, the CISO thinking something different. And then we all sit around the table and we discuss about this question, what it means and how we should prioritize that. So that can be a really great tool to, you know, help improve, you know, the uh, operational aspects and security reliability aspect of your applications. And and this is of course nothing. You don't have to wait until you have something finished to apply it to. You can start using the the tips and the guidance from the well architected framework, of course, early on in the process hmm. to make sure that you will be uh, following those uh, those practices early on. Yeah, it's it's. I, I think it's really a continuous process, right? Especially because there might be things that are not relevant right now. You know, as you're developing, you're not in a, get, yet in production, but they might think that become important later on. So you keep that, you know, as a, as a maybe too later it will be important for us. When it becomes important, you can always go back and say, okay, you know, now we should do that, or right? now it's important. You know, mm. um, such as you know, I mean, while you're in development, you just want to ship things, right? So th there's. I think it's it's really interesting to take that as a kind of a continuous process, a continuous improvement process. Yeah, and um, it it isn't only on on a pure technical level. So this is something, as you said, it, it um, many teams from the organization can be involved in the process and should be involved in the process, perhaps as well. Yeah, so actually, I, I see a quite interesting question uh, around whether we can exclude, you know, or ignore specific topics. Um, and I mean, you own the reviews, you own the review process. So if mm. there's a question that you think um, is not necessarily relevant or something like this, right? They, they can you could just check this. Question does not apply to this workload, for example. Or, you know, maybe it's not relevant now. They just leave it blank. Uh, you know, it, it's, um, 
let's just check none of these. We'll come back to that later, right? But you own your process, right? No one is going to, uh, you know, I'm not going to come and knock on your door saying, hey, why didn't you fix this thing, you know, uh, later? You, you own the, the, the process behind that. I think that's really important that these aren't meant as things that you have to do. These are things that we think will you will benefit from. So mm. the way that we've been building uh, at Amazon for, for many years now, we've learned about how to build applications at scale, and then you'll be able to benefit from those suggestions and, and best yeah. practices around how to build your application. But and not everything applies. Thing... Yeah, one thing that's really important is that this is not a blame game, right? It's not because there's no bad score, right? Uh, and there, there's no, oh, this is your fault and something like this. It's it's a tool to help improve, you know, uh, on a continuous uh, manner, right? So, so it's just a tool that will give you recommendation. It's not something that's going to judge you or say something is bad or not. Hmm. All right, so we are reaching the finish of this episode soon. So if you have any last questions, make sure to pop them in the chat and I'll uh, get Nicholas, our guest for today, to answer them, uh, perhaps on serverless, we'll see. And we've talked about serverless ops. We've gone through observability. We've talked about how dashboards can be built, what you can look for in your dashboard and how to use them. We talked about the... Uh, Lambda Power Tools and how you can be helped by using those. I think we put we didn't put that link in the chat. We'll make sure to do that as well. Um, so anything last we want to cover or you want to cover, Nicholas, uh, that we've forgotten so far? Uh, it's, I mean, I think we covered the main points, but, but one thing that's kind of important is just something, I mean, in terms of operations right if you are new to operation serverless or if you come off for the development side and so on something is better than nothing it's a continuous process of improvement right so um, get something out of the door you know try to think about what are key metrics dashboards are you know something that you continuously improve as well um so it's it's not you know a perfect answer if you are just getting started with with you know all these things of just observability the well acted framework and all these things just give it a try do something learn from it and then you improve continuously right that's the important part i've got a tough question for you to to finish things off with uh, in 2 minutes we are in the midst of migrating from mern stack we are keen to move to serverless do you have any tips any heads up well, uh, so qu quick question, and, and, and pardon my ignorance on that, but I'm not sure what is MERN. Um, so I don't know if Gunnar, you know. Uh, I do not. <laughs> I, I hear the, the, the quick search. MongoDB, then. Express, React, and Node. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's... So, um, so I think on that, you know, the, the same kind of practice... I mean, the thing is, you might actually have some reusability uh, from the fact that you are using, you know, Node or Express and so on, something might not map one to one, but it can be a process, you know, an iterative process. As in, you might keep the data store is always the hardest thing to change, right? But the compute layer, so your, you know, Express uh, application and so on, you might actually move that progressively. Um, same with the front end React, you know, you can start using Amplify if you're not already. Amplify console to hosting your front to to host your front end. Um, so there is a way to to kind of build that iteratively. But now as you migrate that, if you have you know your Express uh, application right now as a monolith, right? The thing is in serverless usually you tend to split that. But one thing at a time. Start with the easy wins. You know that will also give you uh, the kind of learning experience of running the serverless workloads. So start with a few easy easy things first. Um, I think actually for Express, we have a, there is a tool that you can use to, to run an Express application uh, within AWS Lambda. I forgot the name. I think it, it might be something like just called Lambda Express. Uh, mm. And I forget the name of that, of course. But uh, these are the kind of things just to, to get started. And, you know, then over time, you can start splitting. Uh, you know, we talked about event-driven architectures, right? That might be important. 
Um, so start, I mean, my, my key recommendation when you migrate to serverless is start with the things that are easy because you will learn a lot from that. And all these learnings will then help you later down the line when you start tackling the hard stuff. Like the data layer is a very hard piece, you know, to, for example, if you want to migrate from Mongo to Dynamo. All right. So that was a quick question to a pretty hard question, uh, I think. So. If you have any more questions, follow us on Twitter. Ask them directly to Nicholas using a DM, of course. He's always available, I think. Uh, this has been the AWS Nordics Office Hours with my special guest, Nicholas Muchen. Uh, thanks so much for being here, Nicholas, talking about serverless ops. Well, thank you for having me. It was uh, really nice. Really appreciate everyone in the chat with your questions. So, yeah, if if you want to keep chatting, you know, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, happy to 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 continue the discussion there. All right. Thank you all for watching, and have a great rest of the day.